Good morning. Indian Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar, who we know is a former career diplomat, he has recently written a book on nine years of Modi government foreign policy. This is the book, Why Bharat Matters. Now, Jay Shankar says, this is a book of Modi government's nine year in power, starting 2014 when the government was formed. But actually, when you go through the book, you realize that in most of the chapters, there is a repeated reference to the year 2020 by Jay Shankar. We know 2020 is the year when the Galwan killings happened on the Indo-China disputed border and it had a major impact. It sent the Modi government in a shock. And in fact, there was a transformational change in its foreign policy then. So in a sense, this book is not nine years of Modi government. It is really three years of Modi government post Galwan killings. It so happened that Jay Shankar was appointed the foreign minister in the second term of the government which began in 2019. Therefore, it is fair to conclude that Jay Shankar is the architect both of this transformation, transformational policy which comes from India to Bharat. He is both the architect as well as the implementer of the policy with of course the blessings of the Prime Minister. So what I intend doing is make two videos. In the first video which I am making now, I will talk about the transformed or the completely altered foreign policy of the last three years post Galwan killings. And in the second video, I will talk about the implementation. And I will also discuss whether it is helping India's case or it is furthering the case of the Modi government. So let me start with the, what the policy is, the change policy. Now we are aware that since decades, there has been a certain policy, India policy towards China, which has not really changed. It has changed a bit, but not transformed. And that can be put in a simple term, which is Chindia, China, India. This term we know came into vogue after the successful visit of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi in December 1988 to China, where he met with the Chinese Supreme Leader Deng Xiaoping. And the two leaders agreed that the basic objective of the two nations should be the upliftment of the two people and that there was a need for India and China to cooperate with one another towards the Asian century. So the operative word here in when we talk of Chindia is cooperation and Asian century. Now what Jay Shankar has done is he has abandoned this term. He has completely set it aside Chindia. He says this lacks strategic clarity. And instead what he talks about is no cooperation with China because India should have a India first policy. He argues that in a multipolar world where all the nations are transactional, India also should be looking at transactional relationship with all the major powers, and especially of course the Western powers that he is talking about. So no cooperation with China is really the essence of his policy. The question is, the Modi government has been cooperating with China until the Galwan killings happened. So what should be the requirement of the Modi government that there be no cooperation with China? Now here first what Jay Shankar talks about is, he makes a very bold assumption. He says, at the end of the day, relationships between major powers, referring to India and China, are reciprocal in nation. The assumption, Odisha's assumption here is that major powers, these two major powers are actually strategically in the same stature. That India and China, they are two poles in a multipolar Asia, which he argues is necessary for a multipolar world. This is the argument. Now, so he brings up because he does not want any cooperation with China and why he does not want, I will explain in the end. It's a very important reason. So he comes up with a subject which he knows has no answer. It cannot be solved. Now he says, 
he writes there can be no return to business as usual with china when the situation in the border area is far from normal and therefore of the three requirements or the demands that he puts to to china for normalized relationship with india the most important is according to him to begin with agreements already reached such as those of 1993 and 1996 must be adhered to in their entirety in letter as much as in spirit so everything boils down to the 1993 agreement on peace and tranquility between india and china the agreement full agreement reads agreement of peace and tranquility on the line of actual control 1996 is just a follow up giving more details on the 1993 agreement now when we look at this 1993 agreement there are three anomalies or three strange thing that immediately strike first of all this agreement was signed during the visit of prime minister narsimha rao to china he was the second prime minister after rajiv gandhi to visit china and as there is always a anxiousness in the ministry of external affairs that when there is a prime ministerial visit it should be good not only good it should look better than the predecessor's visit and this tendency of india what the chinese were conscious about they were aware of this they know that the indian side always gives importance to events whereas the chinese side always looks at the process the big picture but that besides so when this visit was to happen in 1993 the first thing that the chinese insisted was that we will sign a agreement where you mention line of active control which of course became line of actual control and the indian side agreed without realizing that when you use a term like line of active control or line of actual control you are inserting a military line a normal disputed border becomes a military held border something that happens always as a consequence of war and not because you want peace and tranquility on that border for example the line of control between india and pakistan about after the 1971 war and it is held tightly by both the armies just as the demilitarized zone in the korean peninsula it came about after the korean war so it did not occur to the indian diplomats to check with the military leadership of the day whether it would be appropriate to insert this line of actual control in the agreement or not but the chinese side insisted so it was done second thing now the chinese side said that this line of actual control should be qualified it should be written there that this is the line of 7th november 1959 now the line that the chinese are talking about is a letter that the chinese premier chao en lai wrote to prime minister nehru on the 7th of november 1959 arbitrarily carving a line on the map and that line is well inside the indian territory the territory well inside the territory held in 93 by the indian troops so they said this needs to be qualified as the line of actual control of november 1959 now the indian side did not want that so finally the indian side requested the chinese side that look we want the agreement because they had threatened that if you don't qualify the pla will not agree to the agreement there will be no agreement during the visit of the indian prime minister to china so they said all right in that case let us agree to do this but not qualify it so as far as the lac was concerned right from the beginning there was a problem from the indian perspective it was the line of 1993 physically held by the indian army but for the chinese the lac was the line of 1959 so there were two lacs created by this agreement and the third issue is what jay shankar talks about he has written in the book he talks about everywhere in all the foras that he is there that is that i cannot understand no cogent explanation has been given by the chinese side that why they have brought so many troops on the border because the 93 agreement clearly says 
that neither side will bring large forces close to the LAC. The two sides will not do exercises of a division. Division is about 15,000 troops anyway close to the LAC and if they do an exercise of even a brigade which is about 5,000 troops, the other side will be informed and consent taken. Now, if Jay Shankar doesn't understand why this has happened, well, it is a bit queer. Because if you see the sequence of events, it becomes very clear that everything was started by India and not China. And this is how it goes. You see, in 1993, China was still not ambitious. Ambitious in the sense the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, had not been created. And it had no need for its forces, the PLA, to go outside its border. But things changed. And when the things changed, there were structural, major structural reforms done in the PLA, under which, this was done in 2015, under which Western Theatre Command specifically for India, for a war with India was created. Now, a theatre command is no good if you don't have the troops in it. And hundreds and thousands of troops were required to come there. Which means if the Chinese were to do this, because they had done the reforms, they would be seen as aggressors, they would be seen as violating a bilateral agreement which they did not want to do. So they came up with a brilliant plan. And the plan was Doklam Crisis of 2017. Now Doklam is an area which is sandwiched between Bhutan on one side and Sikkim on the other. And as far as Sikkim is concerned, on the eastern side, East Sikkim, all the heights are held firmly and in large numbers by the Indian Army. In other words, in that mountainous area, India has a major advantage because heights are held by the Indian Army. So, when you see Doklam and south of Doklam is what you have is a Jam Ferry Ridge. Anybody who has an observation post on the Jam Ferry Ridge can see very clearly the Siliguri Corridor, which is a narrow strip, a very sensitive strip which connects mainland India with the five northeastern states. In other words, if the Siliguri Corridor is severed, then northeastern states will be completely cut off from India. So, to that extent of great importance for the army at one time. Now, what they did is that the crisis, Doklam crisis started on the 16th of June, continued for 73 days. Before the crisis, two times, one in May, once in May and once in beginning June. The Chinese local commander informed the local commander of the Indian side that look, since 2007, we have been doing patrols. We come from Chumbi Valley, which is the area, go to Doklam and go till Jamferi Ridge. We now want to facilitate our troops instead of walking that distance in the treacherous terrain. We want to make a road there. We want to make a track. So this was conveyed to the Indian side. Now, Indian side was already feeling very high, the Modi government, because just a year ago, in 2016, they had done the so-called surgical strikes against Pakistan. So they saw in this a great opportunity. Because after all, national security is a high thing, a USP, unique selling point of the Modi government. So, if they could do a surgical strike against Pakistan, they could also stop the Chinese because they were tactically in an advantageous position. So, instead of doing a military appreciation, political posturing was done, which worked to the advantage of the Chinese side. 16th of June, Chinese brought their dozers and they started making the track. The Indian side immediately came down, rolled down from the heights and they stopped the dozers, uh, the uh, track making dozers with the dozers of their own. And the men came down and they came to Doklam. Now, Doklam had another peculiarity. And the peculiarity was that as far as the tri-junction is concerned, Tri junction of Sikkim, which is India, China, Tibet, which is China, and Bhutan. 
there has been a dispute as to where the trijunction is because the trijunction would determine Doklam belongs to which country. For example, since 2012, discussions were going on. The bilateral and the trilateral discussion between the three parties as to where the trijunction is. As far as Chinese are concerned, they said that the trijunction is down south at a place called Jimochin, Gimochin. Now, if you put the trijunction there, then Doklam belongs to China. But the Indian side said, no, it is higher up in the north at a place called Batangla. Now, if you put the, transaction, the trijunction at Batangla, then Doklam becomes Bhutan territory. And India, as we know, has a special security relationship with Bhutan. Since 1963, army training team for the defense of Bhutan has been physically present on Bhutanese soil. So the moment the Indian side came and stopped the dozers, uh, they, uh, the Chinese, the PLA went ballistic. They said, well, you have come in our territory, some 152 meters, you please go back. It is, you have basically severed our sovereignty and this is not acceptable, this will lead to war. Now to give it a push, they brought in what came to be known as the wolf warriors, where they started beating the war drums that there will be a war if you guys don't go back. Obviously, the commander at that time, he informed Delhi, but Delhi obviously wanted to do political posturing because they knew that it's a tactical operation where the Chinese will not go into war because they will not win this tactical information because the Indian military always thinks in terms of skirmishes, not in terms of war. So, what they did was, they said, uh, let us now bring reinforce the forces. So it is the Indian side that first brought in something like 3,000 troops into, into right uh, behind Doklam. Then they brought in more forces because acclimatization had to be done. So it is the Indian side while the Chinese were beating the war drums. Indian kept bringing in forces just in case there is war. Now what did the Chinese do? Well the Chinese said uh, we need to do something in self-defense. They also brought in their forces. So both the sides were increasing the numbers. Over the 73 days, 13 rounds of talks were held in China. All the talks in China showing that suddenly there was panic in Delhi. They wanted peace with China. Somebody had actually done the military appreciation that look Chinese today have the capability. The PLA has the capability. It need not physically come and sit on uh, the Jam Ferry Ridge, it has the missiles, long range precision missile, it has the capability for round the clock surveillance. So it can do a lot of damage even without coming to Jam Ferry. Somebody must have done appreciation and nobody wanted an escalation. So the matter was diffused and the Indian side went back. Three advantages immediately came to China. While the Indian side was beating the drum, our media here that look, it is a victory of India, of the Modi government that we have stopped the Chinese in the track. What were the three advantages? Number one, by forcing the Indian side to go back and abandoning and leaving Dokla, what was a disputed area, the tri-junction, obviously now meant that it is Chinese territory. And they had physically sent the Indians back. This was the advantage. Second advantage, they could, while the Indian side de-inducted the forces once the crisis was over, the Chinese side never did it. Why? Because they said, this is our territory, we can sit here. So they were not the first ones to bring the territory, to bring their forces in the Tibet Autonomous Region. And they brought a lot of forces in Doklam itself. And the third, they clearly showed to the Bhutanese side that under your security arrangement, India was to come to your rescue. But India now says our only military objective was to stop the Chinese from making the track. So you have actually been abandoned. So it was a major victory. I mean, in other words, to say that India proclaimed that it won the, won the battle. The war went to China. They won it without firing a shot. So, this is how the troops came. Let's see what happened next. 
on the 5th of august 2019 india revoked article 370 and 35a of the constitution and the next day on 6th of august 2019 home minister amit shah said in parliament that there will be two union territories one of jammu and kashmir the other of ladakh and akshay chin would be part of the union territory of ladakh the new maps were created and immediately there was a reaction from china china said look there was never a border even when the british britishers were here between ladakh and xinjiang how can you create a border and how can you show akshay chin as part of your territory it was unacceptable to them on the 11th of august 2019 jay shankar himself traveled to china to explain to them that look the new maps have nothing to do with the reality on the ground nothing changes the chinese refuse that we do not accept this at all now something parallel was also going on which needs to be explained not only india was in a hurry to finish the doklam crisis once india realized that they are not taking the troops back there was a bit of a panic in india that the chinese may not do a escalation so the indian side reached out to the chinese asking for a informal summit with the chinese president between the two heads of government which came to be known as the wuhan informal summit unstructured dialogue that was held where india agreed that yes to the chinese suggestion that both of us should cooperate under the formula which came to be known as china india plus that china and india will work together for the betterment for connectivity and development of the smaller nations in the indian subcontinent this of course was agreed but nothing was done except training joint training to a few diplomats of afghanistan nothing was done on the wuhan thing now coming back to where i was so what happened was that china rejected jay shankar's point they said you have done cartographic aggression they were still looking for a way out a peaceful way out and the peaceful way out was this informal summit wuhan that had happened both sides had agreed that alternatively every year once in china once in india it will be held where at the highest level whatever issues are there they can be resolved now they were asking for dates the indian side gave the dates of october 2019 knowing fully well that a full blown division exercise of the indian army called exercise him vijay was being conducted in two phases in tawang an area which the chinese say belongs to us the whole idea was to discourage xi jinping to come for the second informal summit but of course they were clever and they were still looking for a way out a peaceful way out i'm not being on the side of the chinese i'm just giving out the figures and the the sequence of events how things happened so the chinese said well the exercise doesn't exist they denied the existence of the exercise and xi jinping did did come for the second informal summit which happened in chennai and we know because the, his foreign minister wong hee at that time he told their press and it was printed in the hindu newspaper that look xi jinping made a very important point that there should be peace between india and pakistan india and china and pakistan and china which in any case is there in other words he was saying that you please resolve this kashmir issue this 370 peacefully with um, with uh, both the countries with pakistan as well as china but nothing was done on that as well so as a consequence of this when the covid was on in april of 2020 the chinese did major intrusions multiple inclusions in eastern ladakh which the press now tells us is close to 2000 square kilometers a huge territory and at most places they say that they have come and they have come very close to their 1950 line line which they have consistently claimed now if india had not made the new maps perhaps the chinese would not have done this eastern ladakh the intrusions that they did and if they had not done that then obviously galwan would not have happened
but here the whole idea was that look we need india indian modi government want to be seen as very tough against china so now coming back to the foreign policy the policy is no cooperation with china why there are two reasons for that now reason number 1 if china if india normalizes relations with china because after all china cannot be held responsible for all that happened on the border i have just given the sequence of events and jay shankar knew right from doklam time what has happened that the troops have come there and they have not gone but nobody said anything from the indian side because then it was victory so the key thing is that if there is cooperation between india and china then the chinese side will put pressure on india to implement the formula agreed in wuhan the china india plus formula and this is something indian side cannot do for simple reason that they will automatically become the leaders in that cooperation with deep pockets that they have and they are the world experts in infrastructure building india cannot match there so it cannot have cooperation and the second reason is that if india has cooperation with china something that all the other quad nations have today with china despite the trade war despite the te- technology war then there is a fear in the modi government that the west especially the us may not view india as a counterweight to china in the indian ocean region and it may have start having doubts about india's military involvement in the indo pacific defense networks so these are the two key reasons now in the next video i will talk about again from his book how it is being implemented and i will discuss that how it is delusional because it runs against military appreciation and geopolitical wisdom thank you